With the sixth anniversary dash event, this is the absolute best time for new and returning players to jump into Epic 7. You'll be getting a slew of free equipment as well as an absurd number of five stars, both heroes as well as artifacts. It's probably the most generous gotcha event for any game that I've ever seen for my pretty much 10 plus years of playing games in this space. And all you need to do in order to get started is just check out the Epic Dash button that is located here on the left hand side of your lobby. Inside of it, you'll see the Epic Dash Pass, and all you got to do is just complete these daily and weekly missions to just start reaping the benefits and get all of those sweet rewards. Those being things like a 5-star artifact selector, which is what this video will focus on, as well as things like a 5-star hero selector. So that's kind of letting you pick and choose exactly which characters and the accompanying artifacts that you want in order to go with them. I will link down in this video's description my tier list for what the best 5-star heroes are to get in the game. But for this video, we're going to be focusing on the 5-star artifact selector. Essentially, you only get like 2 or 3 of these things. And there's a couple of artifacts that are way better than others. So this is hopefully to inform you, let you know what the best ones are, the ones that you absolutely should have on your account. So let's take a look over here at our tier list. So I have divided everything up for this sixth anniversary artifact selector tier list by a couple of tiers. Stable artifacts are ones that should be on your account no matter what, whether you're a PvE player or a PvP player, whether you're a new player or a returning player, these are the best of the best ones. Next up, we have two plus users. These ones are not necessarily staple, but they're widely used across a multitude of characters in Epic 7. One to two users is as the name suggests, there's maybe one or two users and it's a pretty strong artifact for those users. Those are the artifacts that fall in this tier. Then you have zero to one users that are generally playable. Basically only like one person really uses it, but it's pretty important for that character. And then lastly here, we have the zero to one users barely usable. These are the ones that are not exactly great. And I can't really recommend unless you're just trying to take them in order to complete your collection. And as you can see here, can't choose includes bird's eye view, dark blood keeper and Rudy Jing Bong. I probably absolutely butchered that in. But those three cannot be chosen along with all the limited collab and free artifacts that are currently available in the game. So let's start it off with the staple artifacts first and foremost. As I go through each of these artifacts, I'll hopefully paint a picture for you that kind of explains why the artifact is good, where it's used, things of that nature. So that, that way, even if you're brand new to Epic 7, you have a pretty good idea why you'd want to take that artifact over another option. So first up is Bloodstone. Bloodstone makes it so that a ranger heals someone on your team based on the amount of damage that that ranger deals. Essentially, it turns one of your ranger class heroes into a sub healer or even in some cases a main healer. This is really important because there are a lot of difficult PvE content in the game where you simply just cannot use specific healers or you might have a challenge where you have to use all rangers. And in that case, you don't have a dedicated healer. Bloodstone is one of the only things you can actually use there. It just makes a lot of difficult content easy or a lot of challenging content that normally wouldn't be possible, possible. Having the ability to turn a damage dealer into a healer without sacrificing any team damage is, in my opinion, invaluable in PvE. A similar story here with our next artifact, Celestine. This is a Soul Weaver artifact that changes the Soul Weaver's basic attack into a healing skill. Now, the thing about Soul Weavers is it is the class that is primarily made up of healers, but in recent years, a lot of Soul Weavers don't actually provide any innate healing. They're more just general supports. So in scenarios where you need to use a specific uh, support that might be useful to your team, like say, for example, Inos, which is a free to play character, that character doesn't really innately have healing. So by slapping Celestine on her, it gives her innate healing, which can allow you again to clear very difficult PVE content such as Abyss or Labyrinth. It's also super impactful on some of the best PVP characters in the game, like Blood Moon Haste. Celestine, again, like Bloodstone, allows you to get a healer basically out of thin air and in the more difficult content where traditional healers might not be able to be used, like say the higher stages of Abyss, Celestine is very, very important. Next up is Elvra's Ritual Sword. This is pretty much a mandatory artifact for you if you are trying to play PvP and you like playing either a tanky playstyle or a bruiser-based playstyle. Elber's Ritual Sword essentially gives the equipped knight a chance to counterattack when someone on the team is attacked that isn't them. 
which primarily triggers off of like AOE attacks from the enemy team. It is the backbone of the entire turn two slash tank down playstyle. It's kind of how you get your damage in. You kind of weather the storm of their damage, you proc Elbrus Ritual Sword, and then you counter with a very powerful basic attack skill on heroes like Navy Captain Landy, Abyssal Euphine, Bellion. A lot of the best characters in the game take advantage of Elbrus Ritual Sword. You pretty much can't get enough copies of this thing. Before I started recording the video, I tried to take inventory of how many Elbrus Ritual Swords a turn two player might actually need, and it's over a dozen. So even if you already have Elbrus Ritual Sword, I implore you to consider taking a look at another copy of Elbrus Ritual Sword. You really can't have enough copies of this thing, and it is pretty much the de facto best option for a lot of damage dealing knights in Epic 7. Next up is Golden Rose. This goes hand in hand with one of the other artifacts we'll be talking about later, which is Sigurd Sight. Essentially, Golden Rose is kind of like Bloodstone and Celestine in that it gives warriors the ability to heal, but it's for themselves. It essentially gives self-sustain to warriors, which is kind of important for them in order to grind out specific games and win certain matchups. Golden Rose is the artifact that gives healing to more health-scaling based characters. Things like Edward Elric from the Full Metal Alchemist Club, should he ever come back around, or a character like Robbie, for example. Essentially, if you are a character whose damage scales proportional to your maximum health, Golden Rose is going to be the better option for you between that and Sigurd Sight. Also, notably, I should mention, if you scale off of max defense percentage, it's a similar story. Golden Rose is going to be better for you than Sigurd Sight. Again, it's what allows warrior based bruisers to do their job. Next is Rod of Amaryllis. This gives bonus healing to your team whenever you use a non-attack skill from a Soul Weaver. It essentially, just like Celestine, gives healing to certain Soul Weavers that might not necessarily have access to it. And certain characters like Mott Morancy, who is a free healer that every new player will most likely start investing in, this really amps up her healing. Mott Morancy is a great cleanser by default, but her base healing isn't exactly very good by having Rod of Amaryllis on it. It allows her to have big burst heals and allow you to sustain through a lot of the really challenging content early on when you start pushing higher tiers of the hunt, specifically Wyvern Hunt, or even things like Abyss, uh, Abyss for example. So yeah, Rod of Amaryllis, really, really important, especially in the early game in order to actually have really impactful healers that have a lot of sustain. Next up is Secret Art Storm Sword. This is just a very, very strong artifact. Uh, in PvP for Thieves, essentially when the opposing team uses a non-attack skill, the Thief that is on Secret Art Storm Sword will get a big boost to their combat radius, essentially allowing them to take turns when they normally wouldn't be able to, allow them to interrupt your opponent's strategy. It's most notably used on Green Selene, but there are a number of other Thieves that can actually take advantage of it. Just like with Elbrus Ritual Sword, this is one of those ones where I don't really think you can have too many of, especially because you really want Secret Art Storm Sword to have six copies invested in it to have the 100% chance to actually proc the thing. So yeah, this is another one where I think if you are serious about PvP, it might be worth it to pick up a lot of copies. Next is Sigurd Scythe. We already talked about this a little bit with Golden Rose, but Sigurd Scythe is essentially what you give your warrior if they are an attack scaler and you need them to have some kind of innate sustain. Most notably used on specific Moonlight 5-star heroes such as Lone Crescent Bologna, or martial artist can but pretty much just like with golden rose you can't really have too many of these things most of the bruisers that are in the warrior class are going to almost always use either golden rose or sacred site take a look at which characters you already have if they scale proportional to their attack you want sacred site otherwise for health and defense choose golden rose next is song of stars this is a very invaluable ranger artifact that makes specific uh, hunt compositions possible that normally wouldn't be able to and is also used to eke out a bunch of damage in things like abyss or labyrinth for example it really helps kind of boost your team's damage because it essentially gives the target debuff which is like defense break which is pretty much the best uh damage amping debuff in the game so having the ability to have both target and defense break allows your team to do ludicrous amounts of damage in pve and absolutely obliterate bosses making them trivial so that's why i think song of stars belongs in the staple artifact here. And then finally, we have Windrider. It's just generically the best damage increasing artifact overall for a thief. Essentially, you get a big attack boost up front, and if the thief secures a kill, then they go into stealth and get even more attack power for their second uh, attack in a given fight. 
Very, very impactful. Again, pretty much the best overall damage increasing uh, artifact for Thief. And it's pretty much the best one for almost every Thief in the game that's not like an opener or like a specific counter style character that's played at base speed, like, like maybe a Kron or a Bloodblade Karin. Moving on to our next tier. Again, this is two plus users. So this is ones that have a, a lot of general use, but aren't necessarily as good as the ones that are in staple artifacts. First up is Abyssal Crown. Essentially, it gives a percentage chance to stun an enemy on any attack, and it scales with AoE. So, for example, if you have like a 25% chance to stun on a single target attack, that's okay. But where it really shines is with AoE attacks, where it's a 25% chance on everything, especially if the move using it already innately has stun on it. It can just basically stun lock entire teams and just kind of win you the game. Abyssal Crown used to be the best artifact in the entire game at one point in Epic Seven's history, but since then, more broken ones have kind of been uh, released. Stuns in general are not as powerful as they used to be. There's a lot of stun hate currently in the PvP format, but that doesn't really diminish how important it is. It is still good even in PvE because you can stun lock specific bosses. Think Abyss. Abyss is really, really good uh, to use Abyssal Crown in. You can kind of cheese a lot of difficult boss fights with it. In fact, uh, my guides here on the channel for some of the later Abyss floors, like say Abyss 105, really take advantage of Abyssal Crown and really show you the power of what it can do in PvE. Next up is Alexis Basket. Alexis Basket used to be what Windrider is today. Essentially, it was the de facto best artifact to use for your actual thieves. But now it's Windrider. I don't really see a reason to take Alexis Basket over Windrider. Windrider is just most of the time is better in order to increase your damage for a thief. But it's still used a lot because not everyone has infinite Windriders. And usually Alexis Basket is the fallback if you just don't have more Windriders. Me personally, if you're going to use a selector, I would absolutely get Windrider. The only real reason to take Alexis Basket over Windrider is for collection purposes. Next up is Bastion of Pelusia. This thing recently got reworked slash buff uh, a couple months back. And ever since then, it's been very, very good. Essentially, it gives the immunity buff and a barrier to the tank that's wearing it, as well as the character in the back slot. It is the foundation for protecting specific uh, carries, uh, specific key pieces in PvP. It's not something that you use universally all the time, like the four-star artifact Arius. But for those of you who are serious about PvP, this is a knight artifact you should have in your roster, uh, in your kind of collection of artifacts, because it will eventually come up in higher tier play where you might need Bastion of Pelusia to survive specific strategies. Next up is Doctor's Bag. This is pretty much paramount for certain characters in order for them to function in PvP. Moon Bunny Dominial is the most obvious example. That is a commonly played PvP character and really needs Doctor's Bag in order to function. But it's still pretty good on a number of other Soul Weavers, even in things like PvE, for example. Uh, Elena for PvP and PvE can take advantage of Doctor's Bag. So just overall, um, because of how important it is to certain key characters in the meta and the fact that it is decently usable on a lot of Soul Weavers is why it lands here under 2 plus users. Next is Durandal, essentially the warrior that wears Durandal whenever they get hit, they get a combat readiness boost. This is paramount in order to kind of uh, punish certain people with much slower bruisers. For example, Dark Corvus is the most notable character that uses Durandal, but there are other characters out there such as Designer Lilibet and even Urban Shadow Shoe. So there's plenty of Moonlight Five Stars out there that can take advantage of Durandal. And even in general, some of the other bruisers like Robbie can take advantage of Durandal. It's just generically an all right uh, warrior artifact. It's not my personal favorite, but I recognize that it does have a lot of use cases and can create some very sneaky and crafty situations in PvP where a warrior can kind of sneak up on your opponent, steal a turn, and that turn can then translate into a match win for you and your team. Next up is Elegiac Candle, and yes, that is how it is pronounced. Google it if you don't believe me. A lot of people pronounce it other ways like Elegiac and things like that. Now, Elegiac Candle essentially gives a defense break on any of your ranger's attacks, and yes, that also works with AoE attacks, which means that it's very good at setting up scenarios with uh, characters like Nequal or say uh, maybe Faithless Lydica, any of the really fast rangers can take advantage of this and basically get a huge team-wide defense break. It is very good for aggressive PvP strategies, but also because Misconfile, which is commonly used in PvE strategies, is a limited artifact, and this is just slightly worse than that, 
It can also be very good for PvE gamers, just like with Song of Stars. Song of Stars gives target, which is a lot rarer than defense break, but having a way to kind of double up or give defense break to a ranger that might not have it can be very important for uh, kind of DPSing down specific bosses. Next up is Etika's Scepter. This is kind of like a tech choice. Uh, it's most commonly used nowadays on New Moon Luna for people who are a bit slower and try and play a bruiser version of that character. But essentially, it gives you a percentage chance to kind of lower the cooldowns on the mage that's wearing it. It can be used on a free-to-play character like Carrot, for example, in order to kind of boss down things in Labyrinth. That's kind of another really common place to use it. Um, I've seen people use it on the ML5 Star Zio. Uh, just a lot of mages that really are just like hurting for cooldown reduction. Having a Etika Scepter, if you get lucky and keep procking it, can translate into a lot of game wins in PvP and is also just very, very good to have in longer boss fights in PvE. Next up is Holy Sacrifice. Basically, when the knight wearing it dies, they have a percentage chance to revive with a barrier at the max level investment of level 30, which you get from having six copies of Holy Sacrifice. It is a 100% chance. It is very important to have at least 130 of this in your inventory if you are serious about PvP. There are a lot of interesting things that you can do with Holy Sacrifice. Notably, you can put it on a tank that doesn't normally need to hold uh, Arius, which is kind of like the best tank artifact in the game. So for example, the free-to-play option Arwell has built-in Arius, so she doesn't need that artifact. So she can hold Holy Sacrifice to basically double up on the number of lives that she has and tank for your team longer. Uh, also, people like to do cheeky strategies where they try to kill your tank in one hit. If you kind of have good foresight about the fact that they might try to kill your tank Early on, you could take a tank on Holy Sacrifice, kind of bait their instant kill move, kind of revive with your barrier, and kind of go about your way while that character doesn't have any cooldowns, which will let you kind of like secure a kill. Also really good to put on like a tank on like Guild War Defense because they might not know it's on Holy Sac, and that can steal you a win, get you some extra Mystic Medals for your week, so on and so forth. So yeah, it's a really important artifact, but it's one that's uh, a bit difficult to use, I feel like, for newer players. This is definitely something that you take if you're like a more enfranchised or returning player who already has like a couple of copies of this. Next up is Idol's Cheer. Basically a Soul Weaver wearing this, if they get attacked, they boost up the person on your team with the highest attack. This is very good when paired on a Soul Weaver into boss fights in PvE or PvP fights where the enemy has a ton of AoE attacks. You'll essentially get a bunch of damage out of your DPS as a result. It's not the best Soul Weaver artifact, usually those are kind of the limited ones or some of the ones that are already above it in staple artifact, but there's definitely like a lot of really tanky Soul Weavers that can take advantage of Idol's Cheer. A lot of PvE situations where you can take advantage of it to kind of boost your team's overall damage and pick up wins that you otherwise might not be able to. Next is Merciless Glutton. This is kind of like the staple damage artifact for a warrior if you don't have any of the limited ones. If you guys don't know, a lot of the warrior artifacts are like the best damage ones. The limited warrior artifacts are the best damage ones overall, but they're limited and so you can't really take them, right? Things like Draco Plate or Benny Maru's Tachi, you can't really just take those on these standard artifact selectors because they're not available. So Merciless Glutton is kind of like your next best option to increase the single target damage of a specific warrior. Next up is Rihanna and Luciella. This gives the thief wearing it a percentage chance to take an extra turn at the start of each of their turns. It's best used on thieves that already have extra turn abilities built into their kit, such as Ran, Para, or uh, the ML version of Rin. These are characters that could really take advantage of Rihanna and Luciella and kind of like cheese out wins by just randomly getting one or two extra turns here or there. Uh, other than those kind of like very fast thieves that take a lot of turns, this is not really super important. But for those characters that do have the extra turns, it can just, again, translate to like a lot of free wins. It's kind of a gimmick, but it's a very powerful gimmick. And more often than not, uh, it, it does translate to the win, especially in things like PvP. Samsara Prayer Beads is here. This is basically your budget version of Draco Plate. It's very similar to Merciless Glutton. Like, Merciless Glutton is like, oh, I need single target damage, but I don't have Benny Mars Tachi. I guess I'm playing Glutton. Samsara Prayer Reads is like, oh, I, I need an artifact that gives damage and also defense to my warrior, but I don't have another Draco plate. I guess I'll just play Samsara Prayer Reads instead. So if you're looking for a artifact that gives both offense and defense to a bruiser, Samsara Prayer Beads is a pretty solid pickup. Shepherd of the Hollow basically gives dodge chance to certain thieves that have kind of dodge-based kits. Think of the 
free-to-play character Auden, for example, or any of the Violets, like Green Violet or Remnant Violet. And if they go really low on health, then they get a damage amp from Shepherd of the Hollow. Me, personally, uh, I think that this is probably the best overall dodge artifact in the game. There's like four or five of them out there. To me, this is personally my favorite one because it gives a huge damage boost while also giving the extra dodge chance that characters like Remnant Violet, like Sagaron, actually want. Next up, we have Shimandra Staff. This increases the healing of the Soul Weaver that wears it and also gives a bunch of effect resistance to the team. This is very good on characters like Destina. It can be very good on characters like Montmorency, uh, Blue Angelica, for those of you who are newer. Also, most notably, if you're serious about playing more tank down style or turn two style for PvP, it's very strong on the Moonlight 5 Star made Chloe. That's probably the most famous user of this artifact. So overall, if you are looking to increase the effect resistance of your team and the healing of your team, Shamandra Staff is a pretty excellent one to put on a character that already has a lot of healing in their kit. Next up is Snow Crystal. This is kind of like the warrior version of Shepherd of the Hollow. Instead of getting 20% dodge chance from Shepherd of the Hollow, you get 20% critical hit resistance. So essentially, if your opponent attacks you, they don't land a critical strike, you get some extra combat readiness on your warrior, which can allow them to cut take a turn that turn might be able to translate it into a game win it's most notably used on the character that it comes with which is blue shoe like it's blue shoes artifact so that character already has innate critical hit resistance in the kit therefore snow crystal synergizes very well with that character similarly a character like immortal wukong has 50 percent kind of like crit resistance in the kit so having snow crystal on it no brainer Basically, if you have a character that's trying to not get hit by critical strikes already innately or gives critical hit resistance or has dodge in the kit innately, Snow Crystal is a pretty great one to use for your warrior. Next up is Spirit's Breath. This essentially reduces the cooldowns. There's a percentage chance to reduce the cooldowns of your mage uh, whenever it procs. It most notably is played on the ML 4-star Angel of Light Angelica, but there are a number of other characters that are pretty strong in a lot of PvE content. They can take advantage of Spirit's Breath, Auxiliary Lots being the most notable one. This, like Holy Sacrifice, is one where you want to have six copies of it eventually. And considering how powerful it actually is, I decided to include it here in this upper tier. Next up is Unseen Observer. Anytime the uh, Ranger procs the artifact on this thing, it gives you essentially 10 extra souls. It's kind of like a 5-star Ranger version of the very broken 4-star Mage artifact, Taga Hell's Ancient Book. So that's kind of why it lands here. It's most notably used on Flan, who's the character on the artifact. Also used on Sea Phantom Polidus, Astromancer Elena. There's a lot of really powerful, aggressive rangers that can take advantage of this to give souls for their team in PvP. Rounding out this section is Unseen Observer. Normally this would have been in the niche tiers, like maybe 0 to 1 users playable. Because its only real user back in the day was Flan. But lately, we've gotten a couple more users, namely in the form of the Moonlight 5 Stars, Astromancer Elena, and Sea Phantom Paladus. And I expect as more Rangers come out in the future, it will become more widely available. Having souls is incredibly backbreaking in PvP, and any artifact that can supply your team with souls really helps generate offense for your team. So that's why it lands here in 2 plus users, essentially if you want to play Blue Flan, or you have one of the ML5s listed. Moving on to the one and two user tier. These are uh, ones that are, again, have like maybe one or two uses. We'll try to go a little bit faster from this tier onwards, not explain too much in detail like what you did with these things. Next up is a little queen's huge crown. It just gives bonus damage whenever the target actually has a barrier. Most notably played on Arunka, but because of the innate damage that it gives, it could also be used on Hua Young. Ancient Dragon's Legacy is most notably used on Mort because it's his artifact. It's meant to synergize with his kit, but... When it's played with Red Lilius, it enables her to be a counter to Lua. Lua being one of the most powerful PvP characters in the game. And Red Lilius with Ancient Dragon's Legacy is one of the only outs. Therefore, I would only really take Ancient Dragon's Legacy as your selector if you are looking for an answer to Lua. Because Mort, in particular, is not very good as of the recording of this video. Black Hand of the Goddess gives a bunch of critical hit chance and critical hit damage to the wearer. Very good for a lot of the very fast Glass Cannon Burst mages. Melissa, top model Lulica, even Kawarik who's on the artifact. It's more of a PvP thing and the characters that can use it aren't exactly great most of the time. 
but it does have a couple of uses and if you don't have great stats and you want to play those kind of fast burst mages black hand is a pretty good pickup border coin is most notably used on red sermia who's one of the, the best pve characters in the game and she is free for new players so if you're looking for an artifact to kind of maximize your free five star that the game is going to give you from just completing quests this is a good one to slot on her but it is also very impactful on uh, moonlight five stars like conqueror lewis who was also free from a selector once you beat episode two so yeah the characters that can really take advantage of border coin it's one of the best options on them they just go blazing fast and start to hit really really hard broken will of the priest is a very similar story to the artifacts that we already talked about like merciless glutton it is basically the budget non-limited version of mature sunglasses basically if you have a knight that is trying to do a lot of damage Broken Will of the Priest is a pretty good option for you. Although I will say most of the characters that can take advantage of Broken Will of the Priest, they can also take advantage of Elbrus Ritual Sword. So if you don't have mature sunglasses, Elbrus might end up being a better option most of the time. Just say. Circus Fantasia only really has two users, but those users are decently powerful in the pvp meta those being conqueror lilius and the other being judge kisei so if you have either of those characters and want to play them circus fantasia is a very good option for both crown of glory is like holy sacrifice in that it's like kind of this gimmicky thing you put on your knight in pvp to kind of be like haha i gotcha uh, even bastion of Prolusia is another like version of that where it's kind of like a tech choice for specific matchups you might have a, a knight prepared ahead of time that really wants to kind of mitigate AOE damage and punish your opponent for being very AOE focused. That's kind of what Crown of Glory is for. It, usually you have like one knight in your box that you have on this. Maybe it might be like Last Rider Crow or like, I don't know, even Ambitious Tywin, Blue Tywin. There's a number of things that you can put Crown of Glory on and it could work decently well. But usually when it comes to like tech or gimmick choices for knights, Bastion or Pelusha or like Holy Sacrifice usually is the better option. Double-Edged Decrescent gives essentially counter chance as well as dodge for dodge-based heroes. I think personally it's only really good on Kron, uh, but I know a lot of other people will play it on things like, uh, say for example, Remnant Violet. Uh, I've seen people play it on Savior Autumn, but I'm not like super big on it. Me personally, this is something that you play if you really like Red Kron, and that's the kind of character that you want to invest in. Next up is Dux Noctis. This gives a bunch of extra attack damage to both Pavel and his ML5 counterpart. So if you're trying to play either of those characters, this is pretty much the damage artifact to get and go with for them. Iron Fan basically is only really good on the character that is featured with it, which is Bologna for a lot of PvE content. But for PvP usage, it's a pretty solid option for Biblis. Unfortunately, Biblis is a limited character, so if you don't already have her, there's very little reason, in my opinion, to pick up Iron Fan. Rise of a Monarch is yet another, like, gimmicky uh, option for your tank. It basically gives a barrier every turn to the character in the back slot. It's kind of like a worse version of Bastion of Pelusha, but if the game goes a lot longer, it could be a bit better. Me, personally, I think its best use is for certain Abyss floors. I really like it on my uh, Roz, for example. In PvE, I think it has a lot better mileage there than in PvP. So if you're more PvE focused and you want a strong tank artifact, I think Rise could be a good choice. Sacred Tree Branch gives uh, a bunch of effectiveness to a Soul Weaver. It is most notably played on Sharoon as well as her Moonlight 5 counterpart, Dragon King Sharoon. You can also use it on Ocean Breeze Luluka. This one I think is a good artifact for those specific Soul Weavers I named. But Sharoon is not particularly great as of recording this video. And the other characters I named, Ocean Breeze Lulica and Dragon King Sharoon. One is a limited, the other is a Moonlight 5 star. So if you're a newer player, odds are you don't really have access to them. So I would probably choose another Soul Weaver artifact. Spatio Temporal Fan is something that stealths the character on your team with the highest attack. Most notably to stealth certain annoying uh, DPS like say Genua for example. So that's kind of what you use it with. The characters that wear it are almost always going to either be Lua or the Moonlight 5 star C Phantom Paul. So those are pretty much your two users. If you want to play one of those characters, then that's it. You choose this artifact. That's kind of all there is to say about it. Spirit Purification is something that gives bonus attack percentage as well as a combat radius push to the warrior wearing it whenever your opponent uses a non-attack skill. 
This is obviously used with Teyu, who is on the artifact itself, but he's pretty bad. The character I see most often using this is Hua Yong. I think this is probably the best option for Hua Yong. So if you want to play her, this is a pretty good option. It's like a bad version of Storm Sword for warriors. So if you want to be cheeky and put it on a warrior that can maybe cut in front of somebody, then by all means, go for it. It's definitely not as good as Storm Sword, but it is still a pretty solid warrior artifact. Next up is Spear of a New Dawn. This is pretty much the artifact that you have to have, and you have to have it at a very high level. To use for green senya who is the character that is featured on the artwork of the artifact it could also be used for red charlotte if you don't want to play either of those characters there's not much reason to take spear of a new dawn sword of summer twilight is vildred's artifact it obviously goes great on vildred but it's also pretty good on his master which is ran basically only those two characters could take advantage of it and if you already have really high damage on either of those characters this is going to send their damage through the roof that's pretty much it. If you want to play Vildred and you want to hit hard or you want to play Ran and play him as a DPS, less so than an opener, then Sword of Summer Twilight is the choice. Time Matter drastically increases the damage on a mage if they manage to secure a kill. In PvE, this most notably works with Green Vivian, who is a free option for all new players in the game. It is what I personally use for a lot of hunts for Vivian, a lot of challenging content, a lot of boss content with Green Vivian. So if you want to play that character, I think Time Matter is a pretty excellent pickup. I also use it in PvP for a Moonlight 5 star known as Zeo. If you want to play Zeo as a DPS and less of a disruptor slash opener, then Time Matter also works out really, really well there. Touch of Rekos is Rowana's artifact, and it works pretty well on Rowana. And it also works on pretty much any other Soul Weaver you want when you're just looking for some incidental healing here or there in a PvP fight or even in a boss fight. I think it's kind of worse than Idol's Chair in a lot of, you know, senses, but it works pretty similarly. Your Soul Weaver gets attacked, and instead of getting combat readiness, you'll get some extra AoE healing, and that could be the difference between you winning or losing a fight. I've never been a massive fan of Touch of Rekos, but I know that it puts in a lot of work in a lot of PvE scenarios, which is why it lands itself here. Next up, we have Uberius's Tooth. Admittedly, this should probably be a whole tier lower because it's not as good as it used to be. It used to be the best artifact in the game on Hua Yang. Unfortunately, she ended up getting nerfed, so this is not as good. There are a number of characters out there like Rimuru that can take advantage of it, but he's a collab hero that not everyone's going to have as a new player. So admittedly, this one's pretty weak. The main reason I decided to leave it in this tier, though, is because Uberius' Tooth is not tied to any specific banner or any raid up. So amongst the standard five-star artifacts, this one's exceedingly rare. And when a character can use Uberius' Tooth, it's probably their best option or very close to their best option. And if you don't have a really high invested Uberius' Tooth, you're probably going to kick yourself. So if you're really unsure of what to take after taking a couple of the staple ones, then Uberius' Tooth is a pretty solid option considering how hard it is to actually get a copy of this damn thing. Next up is Wings of Light and Shadow. Me personally, I think this artifact's pretty garbage, but a lot of people use it on Breek, who is a free character that you'll get at the end of the Adventurer's Path with this Epic Dash event for the 6th year anniversary. So that could be a pretty good pickup for you. Also pretty solid uh, on ML Illinav, who as this video is going up, is still up on the banner and probably will be going away within like 24 to 48 hours. So if you somehow manage to pick her up and you're looking for an artifact, this one could be pretty decent. Uh, again, I'm not a fan of this one personally, but the stats show that the player base really likes playing it on certain characters like Illinav, Moonlight 5-star Illinav, and Brig. So that's why I decided to leave it here in this tier. Moving on to the 0-1 to one users tier, playable. These are ones that very rarely see play, but at least they're used, unlike the ones that are below it. First up is Misha. This is primarily used on kind of like Briar Witch's Seria. Maybe sometimes you might see it on like maybe Green Pobble, but essentially it's there to give a bunch of bonus damage to an AoE Ranger, and that's kind of it. Alensinox's Wrath admittedly is only really played on Alensinox, aka Alencia. So if you want to play Alencia, she's somebody you took with your selector or you pulled in your free five stars, Alensinox's Wrath is pretty much the best option on her outside of Full Metal Auto Mail, which is Edward Elric's artifact, which is again limited. So Alensinox's Wrath it is. Beguiling Wings is the budget option that you play on Alvira if that is the character you're interested in trying to build and trying to use. 
Uh, otherwise, you pretty much would have to stay with like Bastion of Hope, which is a free artifact, but is something that is very coveted, and you can only have one per account. So, yeah, that's usually going to be going towards a more high priority character as opposed to somebody who's very niche like Elvira. So, again, if you want to play Elvira, you get Beguiling Wings. Bloody Rose is only really played on the Moonlight 5 star Zeo for his effectiveness build, and that is it. No other reason to play him. Dignus Orb is used on Vivian, but as we just established, Time Matter is, in my opinion, quite a bit better for Vivian and a lot of content. And the times you don't want to use Time Matter, the three star Daydream Joker does a similar or comparable role. It can absolutely work on Vivian or even like top model Lulica, but it is very, very fringe. Glow Wings 21 is kind of like a tech choice where you play it on like Sea Phantom Politis for a barrier for your team if you're a slower player, but it's like her fourth or fifth best option. And then you could sometimes use it on like a very gimmicky Astromancer Elena or Seaside Asaria, one being a Moonlight 5 star, the other being a limited hat character. So not exactly a lot of wiggle room for a newer player to use it, essentially. If you pull C Phantom Politis from the 6th Anniversary event, this could be a pretty good option for you. But even then, I would probably still take Elegiac Candle. Goblet of Oath is the best in-slot option for Para. Unfortunately, no one else can use it besides Para. You take it if you want to play Para. Indestructible Gators is only really good on the Moonlight 4-star Inferno Kawazu. If you pull him and you want to play him, this is his best option. Manica of Control is the budget option for the ML4 star last piece Karin. If you pull her and you are a new player that doesn't have amazing gear, this will absolutely lighten the load and make her a lot more usable for you. Noble Oath is played on basically only really two characters as far as I know. Karina, who is a collab limited hero that new players will not have access to, and the Moonlight 4 star, uh, which is Fighter Maya. So if you want to play Fighter Maya, even though she's not particularly great as of the recording of this video, Noble Oath is a pretty good option for her. Even then, I probably would still consider Elvis Ritual Sword for that character. Scroll of Shadows is only really played on Arya, and only if you have absolutely amazing gear on the character. Otherwise, I would stick with your free Bastion of Hope as her artifact of choice, or if you decide to go for a more speed-oriented build, I would consider Daydream Joker for PvE, and Taga Hell's Ancient Book for PvP. Sphere of Inferno is only really good on Bihu. And even then, it's not his best option. Unfortunately, his best option is a limited 4-star artifact that came with a side story, so you'll have to wait for a rerun, that being, of course, Seal of Capture. Stella Harpa is only played on Green Rowana. I don't think anyone else plays it in any other scenario. That said, it is Green Rowana's best artifact for PvP, so if that's where you're using her, then this is a good pickup. Sword of Autumn Eclipse basically just gives hit chance for a warrior, so like, Zahak? It's kind of about it. Sword of Winter Shadow is only really played on Rand to kind of steal your opponent's souls as like a cheeky play uh, in PvP. And even then, it's very gimmicky. It can absolutely work, but I would probably stick with Rihanna and Luciella or any of his other artifact options. And pretty much the rest of the ones that are here in this tier... Uh, not particularly amazing. Just real quick, uh, an offer you can't refuse is just massively outclassed by almost every other uh, or a ranger artifact that's say in the game. Alabastron gives debuffs to thieves when they really want damage most of the time. Cradle of Life gives debuffs to warriors when again they want survivability and damage most of the time. Creation and Destruction just has way too low of a percentage chance to proc. It's very much a meme. I expect a ton of people to use it with the ML5 Lionheart Sermia with her recent changes coming up in like a week or two. But even then, it's not good. It's just a uh, kind of a meme and people really want to use it. Crimson Moon of Nightmares is only really good on the Moonlight 5-star Spectre Tenebria, but Ancient Book, which is a 4-star, is just a better option most of the time. Crimson Moon of Nightmares will never really see any play, I feel like, on a mage until they decide to nerf Ancient Book or find a way to massively hinder the soul acquisition in Epic 7. Justice for All is a knight artifact that is only really good if you can get a knight that goes super fast. Unfortunately, there's not too many knights, if at all any, in the current format that are good when built super fast. Knowledge Seed is a percentage chance to get amazing boss for your team when the user dies. So you have to be losing in order to take advantage of it, which is not very good. Last Tea Time is a mage artifact that gives bonus AoE damage, which sounds cool on paper, but mages have the best artifacts in the game. Their four-star artifact, Ancient Book, is the best one in the entire game, point-blank period. So, 
The fact that a budget option just completely trounces like 90% of the artifacts in the class makes it really hard to recommend last tea time when you could just play Ancient Book or like Time Matter or any of these other more busted ones. Pure White Trust is a very bad version, a poor man's version of Border Coin. So anytime you could play Pure White Trust, it would just be better to take Border Coin. Sphere of Sadism gives bonus damage to a knight that starts with a barrier. So it's like just Yulha. And even then, like it's not going to do a ton of damage. This one's really bad. I definitely need to rework. Sword of Judgment is very gimmicky. It's used on rangers in certain abyss floors or like hall of trials, but it's a percentage chance to proc and it's not a very good one at that. So yeah, the fact that it's only used in very oddly specific scenarios and it is a gimmick makes it really hard to recommend for new players. Twilight of Calamity just is awful. It wasn't good before Ida got her changes, her rework. Uh, so after her rework, it doesn't even work with her anymore. So like nobody really takes advantage of this thing and actually uses it unless you really need the free stats. Tyrant's Descent is the warrior version of Kaladra, which is an amazing mage artifact, but it's for warriors that can't take advantage of it, so it's kind of bad. Uh, Umbral Keystones, it's a mage artifact. We already talked about how Ancient Book is just going to trounce most of the mage artifacts, so just skip it. And then Violet Talisman is a dodge-based artifact, but it requires ramp-up time, and the characters that want it are made of glass, so you can't really afford to get the ramp-up time. So most of the time, it's just better off to skip it. So there you go. That's every single five-star artifact that you can take on the selector. If I forgot anything or I inevitably made a typo somewhere in the video, because that seems to keep happening, you can let me know down in the comments below or just check the pinned comment for any updates or any announcements. If there's anything that you want to see me cover for the sixth year anniversary Epic Dash event, please let me know, especially if you are a new or returning player. Let me know, do you need help with Wyvern? Uh, or any of the other like newer uh, player experience stuff. I want to hear from you. Let me help you. Tell me what you are looking for. I will try to help you jumpstart your Epic 7 career and reach whatever goals you may have, find success in this game, and get the most amount of fun out of it. As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you in the next one. Later now.